Okay, so should we get started? Okay, so Kui uh, Kui is gonna talk about analysis of Markov chains using high dimensional expanders. Uh, okay, uh, hey everyone. Uh, thanks for the invitation to speak. Um, thanks for coming. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking about some work that uh, we did uh, while was we were assignments uh, during the program and then has since seen a lot of uh, uh, recent uh, developments that I'm gonna talk about. And this is based on several joint works with uh, my collaborators, Nima, uh, Zongchen, Shayan, my advisor, uh, Eric, and Cynthia. Okay. Uh, so I guess uh, I, would, I would summarize probably one of the like really important themes of the program and of the field of geometry of polynomials is uh, saying that uh, if you want to study, say, some discrete probability distribution mu, for instance, on uh, the collection of subsets of 1 through n, uh, it's very fruitful to study analytic properties of some some kind of associate generating polynomial. So, so we do this a lot. For instance, for example, when we look at say spanning trees, if you look at spanning trees of this graph, you, know, you might consider uh, the multivariate spanning tree polynomial um, for the hardcore model or basically the independent sets model. Uh, we have the associated, the associated independence polynomial. Um, we also have, say, this also comes up as like partition functions of, say, uh, various uh, spin systems. So, for example, for the easing model or for the Potts model and the cube colorings. And sort of an algorithmic question that we'll be interested in is like, what kind of properties of the polynomial will enable, allow you to obtain like uh, efficient uh, sampling or counting algorithms for, for mu? Okay. And sort of, uh, you can think of a, you know, the polynomial in sort of several different ways. One in terms of as a list of coefficients, you can think of it as a function. But one way that's been sort of been very fruitful is uh, thinking, uh, studying the roots of a polynomial. So, and sort of it's been kind of, uh, uh, it's been observed that basically, roughly speaking, whenever you have some kind of a root-free region for an associated generating polynomial, uh, you can expect uh, computational tractability for your accounting or sampling problem. Uh, for instance, using uh, the Barbanach uh, polynomial interpolation method that was talked about yesterday. So for instance, for spanning trees, uh, we know that the associated multivariate spanning tree polynomial is real stable uh, just by using, say, the matrix tree theorem. Um, oh, okay, so for spanning trees, we don't actually need to use bar, you know, polynomial interpolation to do the counting and sampling because it has a determinant representation. But for the next three applications, um, sort of uh, a, a recent line of algorithmic work has tried to use interpolation to obtain uh, counting and sampling algorithms. So for instance, for the hardcore model, we have some nice uh, zero free regions uh, displayed here. This is a figure that I uh, copied from a paper by Harvey, Trivastava, and Vondrak. And we have sort of like, um, like the classic uh, Liang theorem uh, for the zeros of the easing partition function, when you think of this function as a polynomial in X. Uh, and then also there was some work done by Fisher in 65 that studies the zeros of this function when you view it as a polynomial in beta for a fixed X. And then also uh, yesterday, uh, uh, Piyush Vastava uh, spoke about uh, a, a recent result on zero free regions for uh, the POTS model. Basically, they show that there's a neighborhood around the interval zero one for which uh, this polynomial in Z uh, has no zeros, okay? Uh, but sort of uh, one main, I would say one main drawback of the interpolation method and sort of the closely related correlation decay method is that typically you only get uh, polynomial time or like efficient algorithms if you assume some kind of bounded degreeness. So like basically all these problems here, they're problems on graphs and uh, basically all except, okay, so uh, besides spanning trees where you don't need polynomial interpolation, these other three methods and sorry, these are three problems. If you use interpolation, you, you uh, typically only get efficient algorithms if you assume bounded degreeness of the graph. And this seems a kind of inherent to the algorithm and not just to the analysis itself. Okay, so that's one main drawback. Um, although these, these, these methods have, do have the advantage that they're actually completely deterministic. Okay, uh, so historically there was a, uh, another uh, uh, Sort of kind excuse of excuse me. Excuse me. Can I ask one question? Yes. Uh, uh -huh. Is it only bounded degree, or is it the fact that all degrees have to be 
more or less the same or the same. So for example, if all degrees are very large, uh -huh. but the same. Uh, I think it's bounded degree. I, I'm, they don't really need, uh, typically, the reason you need bound degreeness is that there's some kind of uh, brute forcing uh, in the algorithm and then you, you want to sort of, you know, truncate the error, uh, sort of restrict your attention to only, you know, a small number of, say, subgraphs or objects. And there you only need bounded degreeness, not necessarily like a regularity. Yes, 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 that I know. But if all degrees are, you know, large, but this, you know, if all degrees are, uh, say, two to the square root of n, you know, you, you can still do uniform sampling. The, the importance for the algorithms is that you don't have huge variances in the degrees. Oh, uh, okay. I, I guess I didn't know that, but... Uh, really? Okay, I good, thought, good. Yeah. I thought Barbinox method doesn't work that way, right? As far as I know. Uh, which way? It's, like Barbinox method. Like, you typically want to look at core coefficients of these polynomials, the first few coefficients. Right, but you have to do some kind of enumeration for that, right? Like, yeah, exactly. Enumerate That's over you need subgraphs. A bounded degree. If you have huge degree, then there is no local neighborhood. You have to figure out these quantities, which... Okay, that makes sense. Thank right. you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. And thanks for the question, too. Um, uh, right. So, oops, sorry. So, yeah, so I was saying, so like historically, there's another class of algorithms that sort of preceded collation decay and interpolation, which is Markov chain Monte Carlo. And let me sort of illustrate uh, sort of a, a quick comparison of uh, the state of the art previously for Markov chain Monte Carlo compared to interpolation correlation decay. Uh, I'm going to illustrate it for just the hardcore model because it's easy to do so. Okay, so for hardcore model, so, uh, so remember, a hardcore model is this model here, which is a distribution over independent sets of graph, and you're weighting each independent set by lambda to the some parameter lambda to the size, okay? And so it's well known that there is actually this like phase transition point for which below this phase transition point, when lambda is below this critical threshold, you can expect to have, uh, you can have FP tasks based off of the famous correlation decay algorithm pioneered by Weitz and also recently by interpolation uh, due to like uh, Peters Rex and Patel Rex using the Barbanock approach. And it's also known that above this critical threshold, basically you cannot hope to have any kind of efficient approximation algorithm. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is like, so, so these algorithms are based on correlation decay or interpolation. So now let's see what was known for Markov chain Monte Carlo. So this was studied actually in very early on uh, in the late 90s by Luby and Vagoda, where they showed that for lambda below one over delta minus three, the delta here is the maximum degree of the graph. For lambda below this threshold, you can get the Markov chain mixes. So you get an efficient algorithm using Markov chain. And sort of uh, the reason that one reason also Markov chain is very nice and people say this is because Markov chain tend Markov chains tend to have uh, very fast running times. So like, uh, and I'll talk I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this in, in a bit. So sort of several subsequent work, subsequent works by Luby and Vigoda, Dyer and Greenhill, and also by Vigoda uh, improve this threshold to two over delta minus two. Um, but since then. Uh, uh, so well, after these works, uh, the question remained was how, how do you get all the way up to the critical threshold? So this critical threshold was known for a while. Um, and they could, uh, the, the field, we could get up to this critical threshold typically assuming some additional structure of the graph. You had some pretty restrictive uh, uh, assumptions. So for instance, you would need either some kind of large degree assumption or like large girth assumption, or even uh, like some kind of amenability assumption. So like where the, uh, the size of the balls of the graph are not growing too fast. Okay. Um, and so, okay, so this is a, so I remember yesterday when Piyush was talking about colorings, uh, one of those really cool aspects or outcomes of their work was that, um, uh, so previously there was this algorithm for sampling colorings when Q is larger than two delta uh, using Markov chain Monte Carlo, and their work showed, gave an, a deterministic algorithm based on interpolation that matches this bound. So they show that they close this gap between deterministic and randomized algorithm. But sort of here, we kind of have like the opposite situation. So here it was like, we knew, we know, we knew there was like uh, deterministic algorithms based on correlation to interpolation that could get all the way up to this critical threshold uh, for uh, arbitrary, for uh, uh, bounded degree graphs. Uh, but you don't need to assume additional structure like large girth or like immutability. Whereas somehow Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, lag behind. Like you can only 
get up to say two over delta minus two um, for bounded degree graphs. But uh, so I mean, here you have to start making extra assumptions. So recently we managed to close this, close this gap. Um, so in joint work with uh, Nima and Cheyenne and also in a follow-up work with Zongchen and Eric, we showed that some, some markup chain called the, some very natural and simple markup chain called the Glauber dynamics uh, actually mixes rapidly for uh, all, any two spin system in the so-called correlation decay regime. Okay, and so this basically essentially matches all, all the known results of, at least for two spin systems, sorry, at least for two spin systems uh, for correlation decay and interpolation. Okay. And then there's also some follow work, work um, which also get this, the same result, but for uh, Q colorings on triangle free graphs. So this was also no, not known before by MCMC. Uh, the work of Piyush and uh, Jingcheng Liu and Alistair Sinclair uh, managed to get this result for uh, using interpolation. Okay. Um, and I guess I should, I should mention that. So uh, at the moment, uh, so the running time improvement um, so I guess one advantage of, the, of this markup chain approach, as I mentioned earlier, is that actually you don't need to assume bounded degrees actually. So you can get an algorithm that uh, depends. So delta here is like say the gap from how close you are to criticality. And uh, you can get an algorithm with running type whose exponent does not depend on say the maximum degree as opposed to uh, these interpolation or correlation decay approaches. Although I guess you could say that, okay, this, this running time still isn't that good. Uh, and it's, but uh, it's still some improvement. Okay, and so I guess I'll talk, be talking about basically mainly these two results, and uh, roughly sketching how they were uh, achieved. Okay, and so uh, basically the rough idea here is that there's this notion of high dimensional expansion, which somehow manages to sort of connect local properties of the distribution with the global properties of the distribution. And sort of this look, uh, and I'll, I'll sort of give uh, more intuitions about this later in the talk. Um, uh, but sort of this kind of local global behavior is sort of somehow manages to overcome a lot of the barriers that previous Markov chain uh, techniques uh, ran into. And let me just mention briefly that these local or global properties are useful not just for like studying random walks, but also for other uh, major fields and subfields of TCS, such as uh, PCPs, property testing. Uh, Boolean function analysis and constraint satisfaction problems, and then also to uh, error correcting codes. Okay, so okay, the rough outline of the rest of my talk is just uh, I'm going I'm to start describing sort of the, the markup chain that we're going to use, and uh, uh, in general, full generality, this is known as the high order walk, which was uh, first defined by Kaufman, I think Kaufman and Mass in 2016, and this was also talked by uh, also the subject of Vidat's talk yesterday. And then I'll proceed to talk about high dimensional expansion and how you can kind of think of it as like a, uh, going beyond lock on cavity in some sense. And I'll make this more precise in a bit. And then uh, finally, I'll talk about how we can use now use correlation decay to analyze high dimensional expansion. And then I'll conclude with some future directions. Okay, so uh, any questions so far? Uh, okay, so okay, so let me let me talk about the high order walk right, right now. Walk right now. So this is the you know, the markup chain that we're going to use to to solve these sampling and counting problems. Uh, so I said this this was first I think defined in the work by Coffin and Mass, and I'm going to illustrate this higher to walk uh, by looking at stable sets of this small three vertex graph here. Okay, uh, and throughout the talk, I'm going to use uh, green to denote uh, like. So I'm going to think of stable sets as like coloring the vertices of the graph, green and red, such that the collection of green vertices uh, is a stable set. So no pair of vertices that are colored green are connected by an edge. Okay. So here I've enumerated all of the stable sets of this graph. So you can have no vertices in your stable set. You have one of the vertex or you have these two vertices here. Uh, and I'm, okay, and I'm gonna construct this random walk. I'm gonna try to relate this to an associated generating polynomial. Okay, so you can, uh, for this distribution over stable sets, you can associate the following homogeneous uh, multi-affine polynomial, which is I'm gonna get a variable for each vertex color pair. And the bar here is gonna also uh, indicate that the vertex is out. So red and the bar means the vertex is out, and then green means the vertex is in. 
So here I'm going to have x1, x2, x3 bar, all bar, because these vertices are all out. And then here, for instance, I have x1 in green because the vertex is green and, and so on. Okay. And as before, as in the hardcore model, I'm going, to, I'm going to weight each independent set by lambda to the size of the independent set. So I'm going to give that a coefficient, a corresponding coefficient in this polynomial. Okay, so I have this polynomial and just add up all these polynomials. So you know, you know, you'll notice that, okay, so this polynomial is homogeneous of degree being the number of vertices of the graph. It's multi-affine, so there are no, all the monomials are square free. And each monomial is in, you know, monomials are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the stable sets, okay? And uh, let me just mention also that this construction of some, this polynomial actually works out. You can do this for any kind of, uh, say, two-spin system or Q-spin system or anything like that. Okay so, I, I, so, okay, so I have all these stable sets and have a corresponding polynomial. So now I'm gonna tell you about sort of so the random walk, okay? And so the random walk sort of does a kind of, a kind of down up motion, okay? Um, and I'll be more precise about what this means. So, uh, let me just like show you a simulation of this walk. So let's say I start at uh, this stable set. So this random walk is on stable sets. So all, or in other words, the monomials of this uh, polynomial here. So, okay, so let's say I start here. I look at, uh, I pick a ran I look at uh, partial assignments of partial colorings of the graph where I just like uncolor one of these vertices at random, okay? And I move there. Let's say I'm, I pick one of them at random. Okay, so so basically this in this step I am uh, uncoloring a uniformly random vertex of the current uh, stable set. And then to move back to a stable set, I look at all possible completions of this partial coloring into a full coloring. So in this case, I can I have two options. I can make this red again, so I can move back to where I came from, or I can make this green. I can move here. And then I'll move, I'll move to the corresponding stable set with probability proportional to its coefficient. So here, I'm gonna move to this, with this stable set with probability lambda over one plus lambda. And then I'm gonna move to this stable set with probability one over one plus lambda. And I, just, and I pick one of those at random. Okay. And then this process just continues, okay? So in words, you can express this random walk as just saying, I pick a uniform random vertex at random, I uncolor it, and then I re basically essentially resample the color for that vertex, okay? And so this, this, this particular dynamics for this, this particular distribution, this particular model, the hardcore model, has a name, it's called the Glauber Dynamics, and it's a very extensively studied uh, Markov chain in the literature. But let me say that this sort of construction of like some of this higher order walk, you can actually do it for any homogeneous multi-affine polynomial with non-negative coefficients, okay? And so this is sort of like a general recipe for constructing a Markov chain to do the sampling and which also recovers some of the very famous uh, Markov chains that have been studied in the literature. So for instance, this not only covers, recovers the global dynamics, but in the context of matroids, this also recovers the basis exchange walk. I think this is, uh, first studied by Mihail Mazarani. Okay. Okay, so throughout this talk, I'm just gonna let P of down up. So I guess first, any, are there any questions about like how this higher order walk works? Okay, so uh, throughout the talk, I'm gonna write P of down up to be, uh, to know the, the transition probability matrix of this random walk. And sort of the, in the main goal we'll be concerned with is how can you upper bound the second largest eigenvalue of P of down up away from one. So it's well known that if you can do this, if you can upper bound the second eigenvalue, then this will imply some concrete uh, mixing time for this random walk or, uh, yeah. Okay, and it, uh, sort of a related question is like under what conditions on this polynomial can you ensure, ensure that this second eigenvalue is bounded? So, okay, so that, that essentially concludes uh, the, at least defining what the higher, what, what the markup chain will be studying is, okay? Okay, so now let's, let's talk about high dimensional expansion. And basically this is an answer, one possible answer to the question of under what conditions on GMU uh, does, can you bound the second largest eigenvalue, okay? So 
uh, it's called high dimensional expansion. And one way to think about it is beyond lock concavity. It's going beyond lock concavity. So uh, to, to go beyond lock concavity, I need to first tell you what lock concavity is. So uh, we say, so it turns out, uh, okay, so first uh, polynomial is lock concave if the Hess genome is logarithm is negative semi definite. But it turns out that you can, this is actually equivalent to just saying that uh, the second largest eigenvalue of its Hessian is bounded by zero. Okay, so uh, this was also mentioned in, I think, Chris Orr's talk earlier today. And uh, now the, we can strengthen lock concavity. And this was done by Gervitz in 2006 and also in very recent works by Anari, Viscaran, Vincent, and then also by Brendan and Ho. Uh, so, a Gerbitz called the strong lock concave basically says that not only do you want the polynomial to be lock concave, but you also want all partial derivatives to be lock concave. Okay. Um, I guess in Anario Vescar and Vincent, they call it completely lock concave, and in Brandé and Ho, they call it uh, Lorentzian. Okay. So, why is lock, conca lock concavity interesting? So, one reason, at least from the sampling and counting perspective, is that uh, it turns out in, in a recent work, um, we managed to show that if uh, this polynomial is strong lock and cave, then this down up walk has a nice bound on its spectral gap and in particular implies a very nice mixing time. And this has since been uh, brought down to the type R log R uh, mixing uh, from recent works by Kran Guo Musa and uh, uh, Anari uh, Liu and uh, Oviskaran and Vincent. Uh, okay. So I want to think of lock concavity as some kind of expansion. So, so this, this talk is about high dimensional expansion. So, so where is this expansion? So, so okay, so we have lock concavity saying that second largest eigenvalue of the Hessian is bounded by zero. And I'm going to interpret this Hessian as being the adjacency matrix of some graph. Okay, so in particular, this graph is going to have vertices corresponding to the variables of this polynomial. And I'm going to connect xi and xj with an edge of weight being the partial, the, the corresponding partial, the, the corresponding entry uh, in the Hessian. Okay. And I guess throughout the talk, I'm, this is all going to, everything's going to be evaluated all once. So uh, yeah, just think of this as being evaluating this polynomial all once. Okay. So this is some weighted edge and this will give you some weighted graph here whose corresponding uh, adjacency matrix is exactly this Hessian. Okay. Now it turns out basically, if you have this condition of the second eigenvalue of the Hessian being bounded by a zero, this is equivalent to saying that the transition matrix, the, the random walk matrix of this weighted graph has a large spectral graph, a very large spectral graph. So it's at least one. So typically you, when you think of expander graphs, you think of uh, the spectral graph being at least some constant like a quarter or something, but here we actually have it's bounded is at least one, which is basically the best you can ever hope for. This is an unbelievably good expander. Okay, uh, and I guess uh, just for reference, you can also write down this transition matrix in this form, uh, just for concreteness if you're interested. Um, but uh, in any case, uh, such strong expansion, uh, we know it actually only holds for matroids, essentially matroid-like objects. So you can't really hope this for such a thing in general. Okay, so we wanna go, but you kind of expect that if you know, maybe you don't have, maybe your polynomial is not exactly lock concave, but it's sort of approximately lock concave, then maybe you can still do the sampling. Okay. Um, right. And so you can, you can formalize as follows. Okay. You can say, say a G, G mu is like, you can kind of think of it as approximately lock concave if it's the second eigenvalue of this Hessian. But okay, so tilde is always going to mean the Hessian is normalized. So normalized in the sense of, looking at the random walk matrix, the random walk version of the Hessian, okay? So you can think of this polynomial as being approximately lock and cave if say the, the second eigenvalue of the he normalized Hessian is bounded by some value alpha. Okay, so lock and cavity is just alpha being zero, okay? Um, and just as an aside, you can think of, uh, it turns out that, you know, this approximate lock concavity condition is actually equivalent to true lock concavity of uh, uh, the polynomial after composition with uh, raising each variable to some power alpha. Okay. Okay. 
so okay, so let's let's first see maybe let's see an example where you have sort of some positive value here. Okay, so then let's look at stable sets of the small two vertex graph where the, these two vertices are connected by an edge. Okay, so <clears throat> Uh, so here are the stable sets, and then they have the corresponding weight lambda, and then one, and then lambda. And the corresponding generating polynomial here is going to be x1 bar, x2 bar, which is for this stable set, x1, x2 bar for this stable set, and then x1 bar, x2 for this stable set here with the corresponding coefficients. Okay. Now you can compute what the Hessian looks like here, and I'm not going to compute the Hessian, I'm just going to draw the graph. Okay. So the graph here is going to have so vertices corresponding to the variables. So there are four vertices. And then we have edges connecting pairs of variables whenever we have a corresponding non-zero entry in the Hessian, or basically for each monomial. In this case, since it's degree two, we have an edge corresponding to each monomial of this generating polynomial. So for instance, connecting x1 and x2 bar, we have lambda <coughs> and so on. Okay. Okay, so basically this thing looks like a path. And uh, you kind of expect, I mean, it's since only on, only on four vertices, maybe it's uh, you know kind of a quote unquote expander just because you only have a constant number of vertices, but it's definitely not that good of ex like as good as you know taking alpha to be zero. And indeed, you can if you compute the second eigenvalue of the random walk for this graph, this weighted graph, you'll get that it's equal to lambda, which is strictly positive in some constant. Okay, so we would say like for instance, for instance that this this polynomial here is kind of like approximately log concave. If, for instance, if lambda is small. <clears throat> okay. All right, so just as we did with log concavity, we can strengthen uh, this sort of approximate log concavity, but uh, now um, uh, we call it local spectral expansion. And this name derives, so it comes from the high dimensional expansion community where um, typically all of these things are phrased in the language of simplicial complexes, but for this talk, uh, you can phrase everything equivalently as in terms of polynomials. Okay, so we'll say it's a we'll say this polynomial is a local spectral expander if you can have a nice second eigenvalue bound for the normalized Hessian of all the derivatives of the polynomial. Okay, and this was studied in some works, recent works by Denor Kaufman, Oppenheim, and Kaufman and Oppenheim. Okay. So just as in, uh, in the case of log concavity where you, you can get mixing <coughs> and get uh, a good sampling algorithm, uh, what you kind of want to say is that if you have a local spectral expansion with some good parameters alpha zero up to alpha n minus two, then you can get mixing. And that's indeed what uh, Vidat and Lapshi showed. And that's actually what Vidat talked about yesterday, which is that if you have local spectral expansion, then you can get some very concrete uh, uh, second eigenvalue bound for the down up walk that you care about in the end. Okay. And basically, what we do in these recent works is that we sort of fill in uh, the other side of things. We, we, we show that uh, these alpha k's can be bounded nicely, <clears throat> like one over n minus k. Okay, for at least for two spin systems in the correlation decay regime. And then these two results combined uh, imply. Uh, the main uh, result on sampling, which is that the Glauber dynamics mixes, mixes rapidly. And this is also the same strategy that these recent works for colorings also uh, goes through. They, they show that you know, in this regime, you can get a nice bound on these uh, parameters alpha k. OK, and OK, let me just sort of conclude this, uh, this part of the talk. It's just saying, it's just summarizing the rough strategy here, which is that you have some kind of local or global theorem, which is uh, what uh, Vidal and Lapchi proved. And <clears throat> uh, what's left to do is typically to prove, some, prove this local spectral expansion. And then once you have these two things, you can deduce rapid mixing for your chain. OK, so basically that concludes like the second part. Uh, any questions about you know, high dimensional expansion, local spectral expansion, uh, or anything like that? Uh, okay. Okay. So now uh, let me tell you about um, uh, correlation K and how you can use it to deduce expansion. Okay. Uh, sorry, one second. Uh, sorry, how much time do I have right now? 
Um, like 20 minutes. 20 minutes? OK, sure. OK. All right, so I'm going to tell you how to get uh, sort of some techniques for getting expansion. OK. Um, OK, so let me first tell you uh, sort of some what was previously known. Uh, or like the techniques that were previously used. And sort of the main uh, result in this area is this uh, nice trickle down theorem of Oppenheim, okay? And basically what it says is the following. If, if you know that the Hessian of the derivative of G mu has some nice eigenvalue bound, then you can actually deduce an eigenvalue bound for the Hessian of G mu itself, okay? So, uh, sorry, right. So if, just, just for example, if you, if you specialize this to the case where you have log concave, so you have that uh, the derivatives of G mu have Hessian having second eigenvalue bounded by zero, then you actually know that G mu itself has a second eigenvalue of its Hessian bounded by zero, okay? So basically, this is, another way to say is that log concavity of all derivatives of G mu implies log concavity of G mu itself, okay? And so this really works beautifully, very beautifully for matroids because this kind of result says that, okay, uh, this is actually exactly the, uh, uh, the reason uh, why, um, you know, in the, in the definition of say, Lorentzian polynomials that Chris Ward talked about this morning, uh, you only have to consider, uh, a polynomial is that you can get from differentiating G mu down to quadratic polynomials, okay? But that's just an insight. Uh, but in any case, so this kind of result has worked really beautifully for matroids, but sort of as we said earlier, um, such strong expansion when you have you know, zero here uh, really only works out for matroids, but not for say, for example, stable sets of a graph or other say spin systems. Okay, so, okay, and uh, so let me just be a little more concrete of why this trickling down fails for, say, stable sets. Okay, so let's look at, say, stable sets of this two vertex graph again. So as we, as we did earlier, um, as we showed earlier, so we have like the stable sets of this, uh, so, we, okay, sorry, so we have this generating polynomial here, and the generating polynomial gives this weighted graph from its Hessian. And uh, as we said earlier, the second eigenvalue of the normalization of this Hessian is equal to lambda, which is some, let's think of it as like some constant, okay? Now, the issue is that, uh, you know, so this bound here, you should notice that it's actually deteriorating in lambda, uh, sorry, deteriorating in alpha. So, you know, if you say start at a constant alpha here, then after say alpha many, uh, so some constant number of iterations, uh, this, down here is going to become essentially useless. Okay, so we sort of have to go, uh, yeah, uh, sorry, yeah, so, right, so, so let me just summarize like sort of the rough pattern that trickling down needs, which is that you need these alpha d minus two to be bounded by say order one over d, and only then can you deduce uh, nice eigenvalue bounds for uh, alpha d minus three and so on. But what typically happens empirically and also what we managed to prove is that typically you have one half, like some constant at the top and then you, it actually improves as you go down. Okay. Can I ask a question? Do you mean the specific proof method fails or that the underlying structures are not expanders provably? Sorry, what I mean is that this proof method using this trickle down theorem fails, but you can actually get expansion using other methods, which is why- Excellent, thank okay. you, thank you, thank you. Okay, yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, so basically uh, the point is to say, all this says that, so this trickling down theorem is very nice. It's actually used extensively in the high dimensional expansion community. Um, it's, it's useful for a lot of other applications, but for the specific sampling applications that I'm talking about here, uh, what I'm saying is that this proof method is not, uh, will not work. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to, uh, so sort of the plan of the rest of the talk is to uh, show how using the correlation decay method, we can actually uh, uh, prove the expansion of these uh, polynomials. Okay. Uh, and sort of to do that, uh, let me, let's first like sort of discuss uh, what, 
uh, these, I'm gonna sort of write down the entries of this random walk matrix in a sort of a nicer form, okay? So the first claim is that you can actually write down uh, the entries of this normalized Hessian as essentially up to some one over D factor being the conditional marginals, uh, marginals of a variable condition on say some other variable, okay? Uh, basically, the idea here, the intuition is that if you look at, say, this edge, and you look at uh, this two partial derivatives, if you divide by the polynomial itself, you get exactly the probability of i and j. And similarly, if you look at just, say, a single partial derivative with respect to i, and you divide by uh, the polynomial itself, you get the marginal of i itself. Okay? And so if you sort of put these two together, you can kind of see that, okay, if you divided this by this, then you will get exactly this uh, conditional marginal, okay? And then this one over D is more like a normalization factor, okay? But sort of the main, uh, main upshot of this is that uh, you can, from this, you can show that you can upper bound the second largest eigenvalue of these normalized Hessians by uh, this kind of influence-like quantity here, okay? So uh, this is, like an influence in the sense that you're looking at how the conditioning, the, the status of say a vertex R affects the status of the marginals of another vertex V, okay? So, okay, sorry. So actually this is a little bit of a typo, but this is the same normalization that comes from here. And then this is like a total influence of a vertex R, okay? <clears throat> and sort of all that's left to do is really to basically what you want to do is really bound the summation of influences, okay? And so for instance, if you've seen like these, uh, you know, the works on uh, like uh, works by Dobrushin and his co-authors like Schlossman, um, where they say, they, so they, well, they work with like a similar notion of influence and using this notion of influence, they can do this rapid mixing using techniques such as path coupling. Uh, here, it's very similar, except now we really have kind of, uh, you know, we have like an exponential family, uh, like an exponentially large ensemble of matrices for which we have to bound the second eigenvalue. So we have analyzed the influence over like say all conditional distributions of mu as well. Okay. But this is actually, a, this is a very related or very similar quantity to the one studied by uh, uh, Dobrushin. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, sorry. And let me also say that um, you, you should kind of think of uh, just a little bit more intuition. You can kind of think of this influence as also measuring uh, how far your distribution mu is from being a product distribution, right? So for instance, if mu really was a product distribution, then whether or not the status of R does not affect the status of V at all. And so this difference is zero. Okay, so th this, this precisely captures the fact that if you have a product distribution, um, this, uh, this thing is zero. And so if this thing is small, then you're kind of saying that mu is also like you know, close to product distribution in some sense. Okay, uh, any, any questions so far about influences and its relation to eigenvalues? Okay, good. So sort of our goal now is to bound this total influence for all vertices R in our graph. And I'm going to just sort of sketch this using the correlation decay method, okay? So what correlation decay or spatial mixing is, uh, says is that essentially this, this influence here should be bounded by something that is exponentially small in the distance, right? So the farther, essentially the point is that the farther away your vertices are from each other, uh, the more weakly correlated they are, right? So if they're right next to each other, if for instance, if, if they're right next to each other and I declare this vertex to be an Indian independent set, then that forces the status of the other, of the neighboring vertex to be out, right? Whereas if they're, whereas if they're very far, uh, what you intuitively want to say is that it doesn't really matter what you condition this vertex to be, like in or out, it doesn't really affect uh, the status of this vertex, okay? So that's kind of like the intuition kind of spatial mixing, okay? And uh, you can show that it's sort of in a very black box manner, Spatial mixing, at least for minimal graphs, implies an order one upper bound for this total influence, okay? 
Um, basically, the, just the reason is that if your influences are decaying exponentially fast, but the size of the balls of your graph are growing only polynomially fast or sub-exponentially fast, then uh, you can write down, say, some convergence uh, series and get some order one up or down. Okay. I'm not going to dwell on this point too much. But basically, it, it, this, the point of this is that, okay, you can deduce in a black box fashion um, that spatial mixing or correlation decay uh, implies you know, a nice upper bound on this total influence. And this is actually also known using other techniques, I think, uh, due to the Bruchin and others, um, that for amenable graphs, spatial mixing and uh, mixing of the Glauber dynamics are you know, very intimately connected. Um, but this is like another way to see that. Uh, okay. So, okay, but we want to go beyond amenable, amenable graphs, right? So what we do is, uh, what you can do is you can sort of open up the analysis of how you get spatial mixing in the first place, okay? And so you, uh, so the proof strategy um, is basically to re reduce this problem to a problem on trees and then use some known correlation K analysis to, to analyze this in a more refined manner. Okay, so the first step is a reduction to trees. And basically, roughly speaking, the claim is that you can, to bound this total influence, it suffices to bound the total influence of the root in the associated uh, self-avoiding walk tree. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm, not, I'm gonna just give like a very, very brief uh, high-level sketch of the proof. Uh, but sort of uh, intuitively, like, I guess the, what happens is that you can kind of follow the original proof of bytes, which shows that the marginals of a vertex are preserved when you go to the Sawtree representation. Um, and you can, uh, uh, okay, so, okay, so maybe let's, let's uh, let me uh, uh, go just a little bit more detail. So I wanna look at say the vertex, the influence of this, this vertex R on another vertex V, okay? So one nice trick you can do is you can sort of split this vertex and then look at um, sort of like a telescoping sum, okay? Where uh, you condition all these vertices to be uh, out. You look at the influence of this vertex on V. Then you condition this vertex to be in and you look at the influence of this vertex on V uh, and so on. And if you sort of do this inductively following the, the same proof by Weitz for uh, his result on uh, the self-avoiding walk tree, um, you can uh, essentially prove this. I don't want to spend too much more details, but essentially this, this part is roughly speaking, uh, can be done using standard techniques. Uh, okay, so at this point, uh, we just have to bound this total influence for a tree. Uh, so the total influence of, a, of, a vertex, of the root on all other vertices in the tree. And sort of a nice observation here is that in a tree, you can use conditional independence to factor this influence as the product over influences over edges. So for instance, basically the point here is that if I have this tree and I have a root, I'm looking at the influence of R on this vertex V. And let's say U is a, a descendant of R and is an ancestor of V, okay? Then basically what I'm saying here is that the influence of R on V is equal to the product of the influence of R onto U and the influence of U onto V. So this is like a nice factorization property. Okay. And so as an immediate corollary, you can, you can prove that, you know, okay. So then what, you're, what we're really saying is that, you know, along this path from R to V, the influence of R on V factors as a product over the influences of all the edges, along all the edges of this path. Okay. And then from this, you can prove uh, that this total influence is bounded by some nice quantity depending on lambda times uh, to the power of the distance between R and V. So this is, this is very much like the correlation decay uh, statement. Okay. Um, right, so I guess, I guess uh, maybe let me say that the reason this lambda over lambda, one plus lambda here is that because you can bound these marginals by lambda over one plus lambda. Okay. I'm not gonna get into too much detail there. But sort of armed with this, okay, so once you have this, and let me say that this bound here is actually also tight for a certain example. So for the path, 
where you have uh, just, there's a no branching at all. It's just a path of vertices. Uh, this bound here is actually tight. Okay. Now we're looking at say bounded degree graphs. Let's say a maximum degree delta graph. And so there can be say at most, there can be like order delta to the T many vertices at distance T in the worst case, right? And so if you sort of plug this, this bound in with this observation, then you can uh, say that this sum here is bound by order of one whenever lambda say at most one over delta maximum degree minus one. Okay. Um, now this is not exactly the critical threshold that we were aiming for. Um, but so the, the, the way to sort of think about how you can actually improve this, this condition here is by the fact that, you know, this bound is tight for a path, but a path should not should definitely not have this many vertices at distance T away. So there's kind of, uh, you know, uh, some trade off here, right? So you can improve this by sort of amortizing this bound over all levels of the tree. Okay. And it's going to sort of very roughly sketch this here. So basically what you can prove is that in the correlation decay regime, uh, if you look at total influence of the root on all vertices at a given level, this decays uh, as you increase the distance. Okay. And if you, if you, if you can show this, then this implies an order one upper bound uh, on your total influence. Okay, uh, and I'm not going to go into too detail. This 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 analysis here can be quite involved, but um, yeah, right. Okay, so but so let me conclude by sort of like summarizing like the, the strategy we, that we took here, uh, which is that uh, so we have some kind of local to global theorem, and then you want to prove some kind of high dimensional expansion or local spectral expansion. And then with these two, you can deduce rapid mixing. And what we showed, what I sort of mentioned in this talk is that you can prove high dimensional expansion using techniques such as the triple down theorem by Oppenheim. Uh, you can use the correlation decay method, which is what I just mentioned. Uh, you can, uh, this correlation decay method is also very related to uh, the geometry of polynomials. Uh, you can use Hodge theory, which is what we use for the lock concave. Uh, in the case of lock and cave polynomials. Um, but uh, you know, there, there could be many other techniques that, there are many other techniques that we don't, uh, possible techniques uh, to get high dimensional expansion, which we don't know about yet. Uh, okay, good. So, so let me conclude with just some open problems. So uh, naturally, I mean, you can, uh, there's uh, the question of using this for new sampling applications. So uh, beyond say two spin systems or for colorings and triangle free graphs. Uh, for instance, uh, could you potentially use this to get, uh, you know, colorings, uh, sampling Q colorings for Q at least delta plus two? That's like one of the major open problems of the field. Uh, can you get new methods to certify expansion, which is what I sort of alluded to earlier on the previous slide. Can you, use, can you have new methods to certify expand, high dimensional expansion? Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the running time of the current algorithms based off this approach uh, have not been uh, that great. Um, uh, they're definitely not like some fixed polynomial, which is what you would definitely like. Uh, so that's also one future approach, a uh, future direction. Um, and sort of towards this, you know, can you get, say, refinements of the current known local to global results, or could you get, say, modified logarithmic sobel inequalities, qualities, like in the way that Kryan Goa Musa did for log concave distributions. And then uh, I guess there are sort of two other more open-ended questions, which is, can you use these to analyze Markov chains besides simple ones like local Albert dynamics? So for instance, there was this very recent work by Dongchen and Eric and Blanca, and I'm forgetting some other authors, which, at least taking some of the techniques inspired by the high dimensional expansion method, uh, managed to analyze the Swenson Wang dynamics on trees. Okay. Um, I don't know too much about that work, but uh, that's definitely, a, this is, a, I think it's a nice uh, research direction. And then also, um, can, are there applications beyond sampling? So, for instance, maybe to um, some kind of optimization. Um, there was some work by Vidat and Lapchi and Geronimo, which uh, uh, Fernando Geronimo, which uh, 
uses high dimensional expansion to study uh, constraint satisfaction problems. Um, so, I mean, that's, I guess that's kind of it towards this, but uh, I think this is also a nice open ended uh, research direction. Uh, yeah, so I'll stop here. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Kukui. It's really nice talk. Any any questions? So I'll ask one. Uh, nice talk, Kukui. Um, do you so for the zero local expanders, uh, zero local spectral expanders? We have this nice combinatorial structure coming from matroids or polymatroids. Is it? Um, sort of understood at all what sorts of combinatorial structures show up in these more general local spectral expanders? Uh, so what do you mean by combinatorial structures? Do you mean like the fact that these things are like complete multipartite graphs or? Uh, um, well, what sort of supports the polynomials or distributions can have? Oh. Yes, she's asking for a Newton polytope, like how could it look like? I see. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess like one special case of like some of these polynomials that, that we study in this case were, um, for example, like these uh, stable set polytopes. Um, so, so I don't know too many properties of that, but um, to be honest, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, Maybe I give one comment. I think there is one difference between that like one big difference between uh, sort of this regime of counting and sampling problems. So, so here we're typically dealing with objects which have exponentially large support in the ground set of elements. And that, that is the regime of applications that we have seen. Uh, but there is other group of people who study actual Ramanujan complexes and Ramanujan uh, high dimensional expanders. Those are, those are very sparse. Those have like support, which is linear in the number of ground elements. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's like having, you cannot have a matroid like that. You cannot have a matroid with, which has linearly many bases in the number of ground elements. So, uh, so it follows from log concavity that you cannot have such a small support. So if you have zero local spectral expansion, you cannot have such a small support, but it turns out that once you allow this approximate log cavity, you can have that that small support. But it could be very different. But yeah, so it could be actually very different, like even but but I think on the other hand, I think it's very so there are lots of people working on finding combinatorial constructions of these Ramanujan graphs. And it's not so there are some algebraic constructions, but they are usually hard to understand. So I think that's one avenue which could be interesting to explore for our community to see if you can use polynomials to better, under, to better understand high dimensional expanders, like sparse high dimensional expanders, the Ramanujan ones. Yeah, are there lower bounds on these locals, on these spectral gaps at different levels <clears throat> in terms of data, like about the degrees in some sense? In terms of, sorry, beta? I mean, could you prove that you cannot have, so you said you can't have a zero local spectral expander uh, unless it has a certain degree, basically, right? Uh, I'm, I'm, sure. I'm asking if there's like something like an Alon Bopana type bound proving that the kth hmm. spectral gap has to be at least at most something if you have at most such I, and such number of. At least for the function of a support, you're asking? Well, I, I don't know what the right question is. You could look at the up degree or the support support or I don't know, you know, some mm. parameter like that, but to really codify that there's, you shouldn't hope to get one over D at all the levels in these applications mm. for some yeah. city type reason. At least for the, for the kind of sampling problems that we're studying here, I don't know of any such result, but there is a related result for, at least in the sparse uh, regime that Shan just mentioned, uh, there was this result, I think in stock of last year, where they study <clears throat> a graph, a regular graph, which is an expander, but also such that all neighbor, if you look at the neighborhood of a vertex and you've restricted that, that's also a regular graph and it's also an expander. They study those, those kinds of graphs. And that you can think of as being like, say a two dimensional or like a, uh, some kind of high dimensional expander. 
Um, and they prove some kind of a Lamba Pana theorem for that case, but uh, I don't remember the exact details of that. Um, if you want, I can point you to the It's by Yuval Pellet and uh, yeah. Linio and Chapman. Linio, yeah, you yeah. can take a look. Yeah, but yeah that's far, the only thing I've seen too. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess I'm wondering if there's some high level reason why in this independence complex, why, I mean, why you should not expect the gaps to be one over D at all the levels. Like, can you easily see that actually the gaps have to be like, you know, half at the top and then not the gaps, the second eigenvalue has to be not very good at the top and then maybe gets better as you go lower. I mean, I guess for the, the, the reason that there's one simple reason why this, the gaps are like bad at the top, which is just that typically at the top, your gaps, I mean, the, the, gra the, these graphs, the graphs these low top, graphs, yeah. yeah, they're only on like constant many vertices. So if it's not, the second log is not zero, it's, it's like some constant at least, mm -hmm. right? Um, well, there are weights too, right? But yeah. Yeah, but typically the weights are like controlled to be like mm -hmm. a constant as well, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I guess there are some examples that you can construct where uh, the, the, uh, the gaps, uh, don't improve as you go, as you sort of uh, mm -hmm. differentiate, um, where it's kind of like in order to get a good, uh, a good bound on the mixing time, you really have to like, you know, impose this like, you know, that these parameters lambda are small, mm -hmm. for like at least for hardcore. Um, but yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe that's a discussion for offline. I mean, there are some other reasons, right? For example, even in this hardcore model, uh, when you look at the top level, like as quickly said, the, t the top eigenvalue is lambda. Mm -hmm. But we know if lambda is beyond the threshold, the Markov chain doesn't mix. If you make lambda a little bit bigger, the threshold, you don't change the top eigenvalue of this matrix. It remains uh -huh. it's still lambda. Okay, so, so something else has to go wrong somewhere else. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And are there inequalities between the gaps at different levels? like in some generality that if you know, I don't know, like if you know some of the gaps, can you get some inequalities on the other gaps? Or is it, you can construct examples with really wild behavior of gaps. Mm, I mean, uh, so I mean, besides this like trickle down theorem by Oppenheim, um, the gaps can be, I think they can vary pretty wildly in, in a given level. So like, you can have, for instance, uh, sometimes on, even on like a fixed level, like most of the gaps are, are mm -hmm. one, they're huge, like the best yeah. possible. But then some of them are like, you know, only like a constant, like say. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I was more wondering, but like relation between the worst gap at different levels. But, uh, oh, which, yeah, which is like what the trickling down theorem says, but in one, I was wondering if there are more things like that that you even have intuition about. Let's, I mean, I don't know if you. Oh. Uh, yeah. One thing I think is true is that trickling down, trickling down theorem is, says that it doesn't go up too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it can also say it doesn't go down too much. Oh, really? You, you, so yeah. you can prove an inequality. I, like I, mean, I haven't formalized it, but I think that should, I can imagine uh, that could be true. I think something, I think you, you, sh you should probably be able to say it is at least lambda over uh, as opposed to one minus lambda, something like one plus lambda, something like that. So it goes okay. only a little bit down, but. Uh, right. Cool. Um, any other question? Yes. So, so suppose that instead of independence that you're working with uh, matchings, uh, do you think your techniques can also bound like the, the, the influence matrix for, for matchings like beyond the uh, beyond the threshold somehow or uh, yeah I mean I yeah okay. I think you can definitely do it um, I I mean I didn't write down like formally or rigorously but I think it's definitely doable you can do the same correlation decay technique to bound influences you see and, and you think like the it's value true. of lambda does not matter, right? Or, or... Uh, okay. I mean, okay. That. 
Do you mean matchings of all sizes of perfect matchings or? Uh, I mean, if, if lambda like, is, is large, then, then it I think tends to like, produce per close to perfect matching. Right? I think he's referring to like monomer dimer model. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. uh, yeah, I'm not sure how to get, uh, okay. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if you can get like sort of uh, independent of lambda. I, I think it should be possible, but I didn't really uh, try. I mean, there is a problem with perfect matching. It's like uh, the chain is not even connected. So you have to deal with all this crazy near perfect matching stuff. Uh, I mean, even considering one minus epsilon approximate matchings, um, if, if, if that influence matrix could be bounded for, for, for monomer dynam dimer on those, And it's in its own right. I think it's 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 a very interesting result if, if you could get something. Actually, there is a, a structure on perfect matchings which is connected, but it's not useful for sampling. And it is Edmonds matching polytope. Uh, so, so you know every 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 matching you can think of it as a characteristic vector in whatever um, n-dimensional space, right? And there is an edge between two matchings if and only if uh, there's a geometric edge, right? So it's the famous Edmonds matching polytope. And this has very, very strong expansion properties. We had shown this in the 80s, which is, yeah, in the ancient, ancient history. Uh, and, and, but, 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 you know, it's not useful for sampling because the degrees vary crazy and also, uh, you cannot even uh, simulate a walk on it. You know, like it's it's uh, hard. It's it's uh, and be hard to find uh, uh, to find uh, if you are in a perfect matching to find one of your neighbors at random. Mm -hmm. But but there is a very promising structure up there in uh, n-dimensional space. We, you know, which which does have strong geometric properties. And of course, you know, simulated, we have to go through to these uh, near perfect matchings. If there was a way to have to walk through some other structures that, you know, do not mess up the whole argument, you know, I mean, that might be, might, might be a direction to explore for generating, you know, perfect matchings for non bipartite graphs. I mean, it's a very wild guess, and it's been going around for a very long time, but, you know, who knows? But it will not be through near-perfect matchings. That is, that is hopeless. Hmm. Why is it hopeless to approach general graphs through near-perfect matchings? Oh, because there are counterexamples where near perfect matchings are in the middle and they form a, you know, hmm. I, I mean, there's exponentially many and they sit in the middle. Yeah, but, but these techniques could, I don't know. I mean, there's JSV type of reweighting. Okay, okay. Well, yeah, okay, it's for people to try, but- I mean, uh, I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't know either, but, 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 uh, but, but I know that, that, Many, many people have tried um, mm. for a very long time to, to mm. you know, manipulate this near perfect matching thing, you know, but, you know, I, I mean, sure, tried, but. Mm -hmm. But, but is there a chain you're thinking about based on this polytope, based on the Edmonds polytope? No, that's a million dollar question. That's why I'm following all these talks. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, at this point, you know, everybody should know it's, that's the big price that sits on top of this, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, thanks anyway. This is a very useful workshop and this was a very nice talk, you. Thank you. All right. Any other question? Uh, 
Okay. Thanks again, everybody. Okay. So we'll Thank reconvene you. tomorrow. Yeah. Bye. See you, everyone. Bye.